we'll say hello and welcome everybody for joining us for our first workshop with uh, the Cincinnati Library's 2022 Writer in Residence, Pauletta Hansel. We are really excited um, to have Pauletta with us uh, to share her many talents, especially related to poetry and memoir throughout um, this year. Uh, we're gonna learn a lot and um, I'm really excited to be working with Pauletta. Just uh, a couple of brief housekeeping pieces. Um, we are recording today, uh, so, this recording will be posted on the library's YouTube channel publicly. And um, if you don't want your video uh, feed to show up, you're welcome to turn your video off. But if it's uh, okay with you, feel free to have your video on um, uh, and feel free to say hello, introduce yourself in chat as we get started. We'd love to hear from you where you're tuning in from, what you're excited about today. Um, it's great to get to know folks uh, who join us for these workshops. And um, I am going to hand it over to Pauletta, who, um, a brief introduction for Pauletta. Um, Hansel is a poet, memoirist, teacher, and editor. She's the author of nine poetry collections, most recently, Friend Coal Town Photograph, Palindrome, and her newest book, Heartbreak Tree, which is coming out in just a couple of months. Um, Pauletta was Cincinnati's first poet laureate. Um, we're very grateful to have her with us now as writer. She's also served as writer in residence at Thomas More University and at Wordplay, um, a literary and literacy organization for young writers. Um, both organizations we love to work with at the library. And um, so of course, she is eminently qualified for this position and we're so lucky to have her. And without further ado, Pauletta, please take it away. All right, thanks Maggie and thanks everybody for showing up. I really appreciate it. This is my, my first workshop as a Library Foundation writer in residence. So it's ex exciting to, to see all, uh, all of you both familiar faces and, and new faces. Um, we're actually, we're actually going to start with a little bit of, of self-introduction for people who are willing, uh, willing to do that. And the, uh, I've, I've got a question for you as part of that introduction, and it's related to the, to the memoir writing prompt that I'll be offering a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So if you're willing to introduce yourself, um, why don't you go ahead and unmute if you're able, if you're able to without barking dogs or whatever in the background. And what I'll do since we can't uh, sort of go around a circle and have people introduce themselves in turn, what, what I'll do is I'll call on people and I'll say who's up, who's up first and then who's after that next, who's after, the, uh, after that person. So if you're, uh, if you're unmuted, I will know that you are willing to do that. Um, so the, um, the question is, if you can say your name, if you choose, although I guess I'll also be saying your name, and one place that you remember from uh, where either you, grow up, you grew up or some place that you consider to be a home, even, even if it wasn't um, where you grew up. So for example, I would say uh, just off the top of my head, that I, I'm Pauletta. Um, and what I'm remembering right now is the empty lot that I walked by on my way downtown that always smelled like honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's my introduction. So uh, Eileen, you're up and then Bucky, you're after Eileen. I'm Eileen Trouth. I'm from Cincinnati. I grew up on the west side and now live downtown. And yesterday I had the memory of, I'm pretty sure this was true, my father jacking the car up to put on chains. And I think he got underneath the car to put chains on when it would snow. And then we would drive around with uh, chains on the car. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, Bucky and then Vicki Phillips. Yes, uh, my name is Bucky Ignatius, and what's on my mind at this time of year, every year for quite a number now, is uh, this same weekend, actually a couple of days from now, around the first day of February uh, in 1966, when my father died. 
uh, very suddenly and under very strange circumstances for me. I had just been with him the night before and I hitchhiked back to school and was in a different place and a different world when I found out. And uh, that was an extremely pivotal moment as I'm learning more and more the older I get. Thanks, Bucky. Uh, Vicki and then Ann McCracken. Uh, I'm Vicki. I um, am from, I I'm in North College Hill right now. I'm from New Milford, Connecticut. My family's lived there since its founding in the 1700s. And we lived on the outside of the center of town. So just not, I wouldn't say in town, but behind our house was extensive woods um, that were, were um, at one time had been farm fields, but had grown back up into woods. And so that was our major imagination play territory. That's Thank great. you. Thanks, Vicki. And for folks who are just coming in, I'm, I'm calling on people who are unmuted and asking folks to say their, say their names and a place that they remember from uh, where they grew up or, or place, another place that they consider home. Uh, and so Anne McCracken is next. And then Cheryl, you're after Anne. Uh, Anne, you're muted. I'm sorry. I called on you even though you were muted. Do you not want to speak? No, uh, no, I'm unmuted now. Okay. I think. Um, I'm Ann McCracken. Um, I live now in Wyoming, Ohio. I've lived here since 1982, although I only meant to be here till 1985. And um, <laughs> I'm actually originally from North Central Pennsylvania. And the place I'm thinking of is my great uncle's farm on top of Green Mountain, um, sitting on a swing. Um, on the porch, which kind of wrapped around on two sides and um, kind of looking at all the things that are going on there. Thanks, Ann. Uh, let's see, I think, I, Cheryl, I said you were next, didn't I? Okay, I'm already, I'm already forgetting. So, so Cheryl is next. And then it looks like Ann Greenfield has her hand raised that she wants to speak. Okay, so, well, I can identify with uh, Ann McCracken as far as coming to Cincinnati. Uh, I came in 80 and I had intended not to stay more than six months. <laughs> and I've been here since. I, uh, my family moved all over the Midwest. And one of the wonderful memories I have, there were a lot of difficult ones, but just our first house, my dad was post World War II and we got this little tiny house and right beside it was a meadow. And I was just kindergarten age and we lived there for five years. And uh, the meadow, our, our uh, street ended in a cul-de-sac and there was a meadow right next door to, my, to our home. And I would go out there uh, every day and there were uh, tall grasses as a little kid, they were up to my shoulders or whatever, but we made paths through those grasses and um, a meeting place. And what I remember a lot is the grasshoppers and how they spit. I was just fascinated by that. Thank you, Cheryl. So Anne Greenfield, did you want to speak and and then Leslie Clark, Clark you will be after Anne if Anne speaks although I think we might have just lost her no nope, there she is yes yeah I'd better wait I'll I'll wait a little bit okay okay thank you Anne uh, so Leslie and then Tom Strunk hi I'm Leslie Clark and I live in um, Cincinnati Ohio right now but I was born in West Virginia and one of my favorite memories. Um, that started in West Virginia, but my mom and I continued when we moved to Cincinnati was sitting out in the summer nights in the backyard and we'd um, watched for fireflies or lightning bugs as we called them then. And, um, and then we'd see how many stars we could see in the sky. And if it had just rained, we would smell the, the essence of the rain. Those are some of my favorite times, thanks. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Tom and then Karen. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Tom Strunk, and I live in Northside now. Uh, I grew up in Northeast Pennsylvania and myself on the Delaware River, actually, uh, along New Jersey. And so on a snowy day like today, yesterday, I remember 
kind of the hillsides, which are on each side of the river and going sledding on one of them and kind of looking off to the other side of the river and seeing these nice snow covered hills. And if you, you know, kind of banged your sled, you could sort of hear the echo coming off those hills back at you. Um, so mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking of. Thank you, Tom. And Karen, if you didn't want to speak, you can just shake your shake your head. All right, that's fine. Sorry about that. I'm not following my own rules that I set for myself. That's not a very good beginning, is it? <laughs> so uh, Lauren, you'll be up next and Mary McCoy after Lauren. Lauren Hanessian. I grew up in uh, just outside of Buffalo, New York, um, pretty much on the shores of Lake Erie. And we used to get wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Because sometimes you're a little soft, but yeah, yeah this computer does not always pick up as well as it should. Um, yeah, I grew up outside of Buffalo, New York, and we used to get wonderful blizzards when I was a kid. Uh, of course, we loved it. And I, the big, the big, big blizzard that I remember was three days off of school, which was very unusual because Buffalo was used to snow. And they were used to plowing things out. Anyway, we lived next door to a church with a huge parking lot. And my brother and I, and he had three guy, three little boy friends from behind us, and we'd all get together in that parking lot. And this this time, the this plows had plowed it, and the, the hills were steep enough for us to sled down in the parking lot. So instead of going to our usual sledding place along the creek, here we were right next door sledding and it was so much fun uh and i just remember the crispness of the air it was, must have been very cold because i remember that clearly mm. and uh it's just i don't know it was a wonderful time thank you lauren uh mary and then uh vicky feels strange to hear you call me mary paulette <laughs> I know it's just it's like what's it it's it's the name that's in front of me sorry about that Matt no that's quite Matt that's and quite all right Vicky. Pauletta and I have been friends for 36 years I think it is I tried to figure it out the other day so uh, it, she knows me by Mac and I I live now in Vermont and have been here 19 years but prior to that I lived in um, Cincinnati for 20 years in various neighborhoods but I grew up in St. Joe Missouri and my place that I'm thinking of was up the uh, street from us and around the bend and in a hillside that was wooden. And as a, the, four, the youngest of four children and in a household with seven people and on a neighborhood that seemed to just be overflowing with kids, I had a place where I could be alone on, in this wooded hillside where I would sit where uh, uh, below a big tree where the, the roots of the tree kind of created a place for me that was just perfect for my rear end. And I love to go sit there and be comforted by that tree. And uh, as I grew older, I didn't fit so well, but I didn't need the tree quite as much as I got older. Thanks, thanks, Mac. Uh, Vicki and then Unique. Um, I live in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky right now, but I grew up in Louisa, Kentucky, down in Eastern Kentucky. And the place that comes to mind for me is there was a hill behind our house that I would head up to every day after school. There was a mountain stream there and it was kind of a plateau and it just kind of became my place and my sanctuary. I would turn rocks over for crawdads in the creek and I could just rest back there on that plateau and look down on the big sandy river. It was right in front of our house and it sort of had to look at the bend in the river and it was just, it was, it was my sanctuary. Mm -hmm. and my place it was like pioneer woman there. <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. Uh, unique, and then it looks like Judith is unmuted. Am I unmuted? Can you yes. hear me? Okay. Unique, yes, yes. I, um, I love the stories that I'm hearing so far. <laughs> Very vivid. Um, I live in Cincinnati, and um, I was born here, but my parents relocated to Birmingham, Alabama when I was five. And my memories, I have some good memories here, but Birmingham stands out for me. Um, my grandfather had a farm in Plannon, Alabama, and he grew watermelons. And so my cousins and I would put the watermelons in our red wagon and go through the neighborhood in Birmingham. And we would just call out watermelons, watermelons. So my grandfather always said, well, you know, you guys can keep just 
keep one for yourself. If you don't sell them all, he said, you can have it. Well, of course we wasn't gonna sell the last watermelon. <laughs> we would get back to in front of our home, my grandparents' home and uh, busted on the sidewalk. And we would just gorge ourselves on watermelon until our stomachs was gonna burst. So I just remember the hot summer days in Alabama and uh, those watermelon days. <laughs> Thank you, Unique. Uh, Judith, uh, if you want to, yes. to speak, and then uh, if any, I think I've gotten everybody else who's unmuted. And is, so if you still want to speak, unmute, there's another, uh, then unmute yourself. So, Judith? Uh, yes. My name is Judy Harper, and uh, I, uh, I live in Kennedy Heights. I was born in Columbus, Ohio. And my memory is of my, my grandmother's house and our backyard, which was not a very big backyard, but every square inch, except for the little postage stamp size lawn, every square inch was filled with flowers and vegetables and things I didn't even know what they were I mean my my grandmother had a she could grow anything and she grew everything and um at one point she had a she had a a, a, a grape arbor in this yard which was not really big enough for anything of the kind and um and I guess my one of my memories is just sitting on the back steps, on the back steps, looking out at that yard and um, just being by myself and thinking really deep thoughts. So. Yeah, thank you, Judith. Mm -hmm. And then I see Anne is unmuted and Anne, I think you're our last one. Okay, um, thanks for waiting. Um, I had to be in a place where there wasn't going to be a lot of loud background music and people talking in stores and everything. Right now I'm in Silverthorne, um, Colorado. So um, anyway, I grew up mostly in Baltimore and uh, don't have too many good memories of that. But um, one memory I do have was of sort of leaving my house and walking down the road and getting into a bunch of trees and woods and walking along a stream and like bivouacking and imagining that nobody knew where I was. So I do remember that great with great fondness. That's great. Thank you, Anne. And thank and thanks all of you for these stories. And hold hold on, hold on to these thoughts. And if if, if others are you of you who haven't spoken are being reminded um, of uh, your own stories. That's a good thing as well. So I hope you can see my screen. It says writing our lives. Now I'm, I'm sharing a screen. Hopefully folks are able to see that. I wanna go ahead and, and get us moving into the rest of our agenda. And I'll start uh, by just uh, kind of doing the little outline of, of, our, um, of our workshop today. We've already done the first part, which is a check-in with a place we remember from a childhood town or neighborhood. And then we're gonna move into some writing time. I'm gonna offer a prompt and you will be shocked to find out that the prompt is about place <laughs> from uh, similar to how we began. Um, and we'll have hopefully an opportunity for a little brief sharing, You know, probably not from everyone, but we'll, uh, we'll try to get to as, as many people to share a, a couple of sentences or a paragraph from their writing as, um, as you would like to. And then we'll end up with a little, a little conversation, a little sort of craft lesson on uh, some of the elements of memoir. And then if there's time, hopefully a little bit of reflection uh, at, at the end. But we've got a full, uh, you know, full house and a full agenda. And this, this writing, the writing part is the most important. So I wanna make sure that we're, we're able to get to that and then hopefully a little bit of sharing. I also just will say um, that you're going to get these slides. I will make a PDF of the slides and, and Maggie from the library is kind enough to, to send them out to, to everyone. So you'll get these slides. So if you, you know, if you miss something or if you want to try again uh, to, uh, you know, sort of hit, hit the prompt from a different angle, you know, don't worry in, about not being able to catch everything because you'll, you'll get these, uh, get these soon shortly after the workshop. 
But I want I want to go ahead and start with a short piece of writing of mine, uh, which is uh, it's considered I consider it a prose poem, but it could also be called a flash a flash memoir. But just to kind of set the set the scene a little bit for the prompt that we're going to be doing, and I'll and I'll read it aloud. So if you're not able to read it, that's fine. It's from uh, uh, my book Coal Town Photograph called The River. On one side of the road, there was the mountain sliced open and hollowed in places to make room for more town, and on the other side, the river, though nobody called it that. Behind the dairy bar, the turnaround spot for the older kids' nightly cruising, it was a sewer. In the spring, when the rain brought down runoff from the mines, it was a flood, claiming from our neighbors' basements the things they'd put away for later, picture albums, worn quilts, and Mamma Singer sewing machine. Afterwards, pieces of cars, mildewed sheets, and pampers all found their way to the banks or to the peeled branches of sycamores hanging above. Leaving the dairy bar, the Knot River wandered through town, splitting it into unequal halves. That summer I turned 13, I pedaled my bike across a rusted bridge to a part of town I'd never heard of, where I saw no one, a wild west ghost of a town like on TV with an abandoned train station that was mostly splintered platform and tumble down bricks, weeds growing up through broken out storefronts and caved in houses like turtle shells I'd see smashed on the road. I craved the old town's emptiness and how the pounding of my heart echoed beneath the cicada's shrill song. From there, I'd bike the road along the banks, stopping on the graveled berm with its Queen Anne's lace and honeysuckle the flowers of places unclaimed, breathing in my own aloneness. Never had I strayed so far from home. I thought I'd left it all, my mother's hovering love, the too muchness of my body. I'd return dry inside, that solitary self glistening with my own salt. And the reason I wanted to share this particular piece or one of the reasons is because it came to me from this prompt that I'm gonna be offering us now as, as writing. So I'm gonna walk through the prompt and then show you a couple of examples and then I'll move, I'll, I'll put the screen back onto, onto this prompt so you'll have it for, to be able to see it for our 15 minutes of, of sketching. So, I didn't say in advance, I didn't ask Maggie to send out a, an email in advance saying, oh, we're going to start by drawing, because if it were me, it would scare me to death, because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not someone who's a particularly good artist. But just to remember that this is, this drawing is only going to be seen by you, and it is sort of the pre-work of going into the writing prompt that we'll do. So we're gonna take about, I'm gonna say about 10 minutes. It's just 15 here, but I'll set the timer for, for 10 um, to sketch a map of one of the earliest places, for example, neighborhood, suburb, street, holler that you remember. Include on your map, the physical geography. So creeks, hills, meadows, the, you know, the, the man-made ones as well, like buildings and parks and, the huge water pedal that you jumped into every spring, you know, so whatever is important, it won't be everything unless you've got like a, that kind of memory that remembers everything and I don't, but it's, it'll be the ones that are important to you. And then also the social geography, you know, who lived where, what were the secret places, where you were afraid to go, where did you go even though you were told not to go, you know, where were your friends, where were the weird people, where did good things happen? Where did you always get into trouble? You know, so those, those important to you social places. And then also schools and churches and gathering places that seem relevant to you. Really anything that seems relevant to you should be on your map. And I just wanna, <coughs> excuse me, I just wanna show you a couple or uh, three examples actually from some of my younger students. And I know you won't be able to see them very well. Sorry about that. Um, but so here are three different examples. These were all rural uh, students. So it's maybe a little bit example than what we had, but you know, so here's, here's one, you know, my house, Nan's house, the garden, the creek. Um, so she really sort of did her immediate, I think it's a she, her immediate uh, surroundings. Here's another one. This, this person actually did their house. 
you know, they chose instead of, I think in, in this prompt I'd said, you know, uh, draw a place that is your place, you know, and for her, her house was her place, that was her territory. I also like that that she did like the sort of the route that she would take throughout the house. That, that's, that's what that is um, there. And then here's another one uh, where you can, I'm not sure if you can really see it up here, but it says Buckhorn, Kentucky. So she drew her little town or he drew her his little town. I'm not sure. I keep saying she. Um, and I'm not really, I don't really remember. So, you know, there's all the houses on the street, there's the church, there's the road going in. So those are sort of three very different, uh, different takes on, um, on the map. And if you saw mine, you would know that anything you draw is going to be more to scale than what I do, because again, I'm not, I'm not a, a visual artist. So I'm leaving, I'm leaving this up. Uh, but let me tell me if you have, I can't, uh, because it's up, I can't really see the chat. So if you have a question that, uh, that you need to ask in order to do this prompt, if you just un unmute yourself and tell and ask that question real quick. Okay. So I'm going to assume not because I'm not seeing unmuted. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm leaving this up. I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes, pull out your journal or a piece of typing paper or whatever you need and make your map. Okay. So hopefully everybody was able to get, um, get some, some uh, places sketched out and have some memories start to emerge from those places because that's what we're gonna do next as you might expect is to use, um, use the map to do some writing. And I'm going to, uh, since I shortened the, the drawing time a little bit, I'm actually going to lengthen the writing time a bit. So we'll have about 20 minutes instead of 15 minutes um, to let the map, uh, let the places on the map bring back the sensory memories of the place. Smells, touches, sounds, tastes, and sights, its specific, its specific somewhereness. So, and I'm just putting that out there because I think, you know, where, where I often will tend to go and is in terms of sort of what happened, what I did, what I thought about, and instead, and, and all of those things are important. So not instead, but also now that you have this map and you have these places in your mind, I just want to encourage you to, as you use these places as a, as a starting place for, for your writing, to, um, to use them to their full advantage. And that means they're, they're the sensory memories as well as the emotional memories or the action memories that you might have. And so choose a place on the map or more than one place on the map and write about it, you know, write, write, uh, write what you remember and make up <laughs> what you don't remember if you need, if you need to, you know, sort of fill in the gaps um, with, uh, with speculation if you choose to. And if you need, you know, if you need a place to start, you might just choose a map, a place on the map and begin simply with the phrase, here is where I you know, here is where I went when I when I needed to be alone. Here is where um, you know, where I remember, you know, seeing my father for the last time. Here is whatever. Um, and you can write to more than one place if you choose to, or you can just can can stick with the one that that uh, comes to you first and write a whole story from there. So whatever whatever uh, you choose, uh, wherever you choose to go with it is fine. So before I set the timer, any any questions or concerns uh, that people have that you want to make sure to ask before uh, before the writing time begins? Okay, and I will also uh, I figured out how to see the chat, so I will also keep an eye on the chat as I'm writing. So if you have a question, uh, you might put it in the chat first, and then if you can't uh, get my attention, you can you can unmute and. Um, and ask it aloud. All right, so I'll I'll set the I'll set the timer for twenty minutes, and we'll look forward to hearing a little bit of what people have to say. So see if you can't bring yourself to a good stopping place, uh, knowing that you will be able to return uh, to your writing whenever you choose to. And of course, I'm going to stop the share.
right now. But, and, and of course, if you want to keep your video off and your, your uh, uh, even turn your sound off and keep writing, that's, that's fine as well. I don't wanna, don't wanna stop you. And that's one of the beautiful things about Zoom. You can be doing whatever you want to back behind, the, <laughs> behind, your, behind your screen. But I did want to bring us back together um, to do just a little bit of sharing for those who would uh, choose to, and for as many as we have time to hear just a couple of, of sentences or a paragraph from, and then spend just a little bit of time talking about memoir more generally and giving uh, some ideas for how you might expand on this or other writing um, as you choose, as you choose to. Um, but let's uh, let's see if we can't at least um, hear from um, about six or seven people, maybe even a, a few more doing just a few sentences or a paragraph. And, mm. and uh, Maggie's going to help me keep an eye on that. And so what I would just ask, if you know how to use the raise your hand function, on <laughs> on Zoom, do that if you would like to, to share. And if you can't uh, do, th do the raise your hand function on Zoom, raise your hand like this <laughs> so that we'll, uh, so that we can actually phys physically, um, physically see it. So be thinking about that. But I see uh, right now that Anne has her hand up. And so Anne, would you like to, to share a few sentences or a paragraph? Sure, sure. Um, he said, we're flooded. We need to leave. Out the window, there was a lake. Water was halfway up the telephone pole. The cars were submerged. We went downstairs. We had to wade through a foot of water. We waited for Mr. Rosenberg next door to pick us up in his boat. Mrs. Rosenberg wouldn't leave her house without her antique chairs raised above her head. Brought... Um, brought just up and across the street where we and others waited for the water to subside. Then we went back home. Mom immediately started to get the books that had gotten soaked and spread them out on the front porch to dry. Dad retreated to the living, Dad retreated, made himself an American cheese sandwich and sat by himself in the living room, paralyzed. I don't remember what happened to the guinea pigs. Um, I'm only thinking of this now. I have no idea. They must have drowned, like so many of the dreams I had of having a real father. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, Eileen, would you like to share a paragraph or so? Sure. Baycrest Drive was the main street of the post-World War II subdivision where I grew up. It was carved out of a farm across Sobed Lane from one of the big houses that dotted this part of the west side, just beyond the boundary of Price Hill. We lived on the corner at the entrance. From our side yard, we could see the big house. Later, smaller houses cropped up in front as its descendants of the original owners gradually sold off land. Sobed Lane was a bigger road. It took us in one direction to church and grade school in the other direction to the shopping center. It took me to the corner of Sylvet and Sydney Road, a block away where I caught the Addiston bus to high school. But before those days, my world was limited to Faycrest Drive. Um, I, I had a couple other sentences, should I go on? Yeah, go, go ahead and read Okay, yeah. branching off from Faycrest were, were other smaller streets. On summer mornings, we children spilled out of our identical houses onto the street to plan the day's events. Sometimes we played four squares in the middle of the street, the squares being the large concrete blocks with tar lines between them. There weren't many cars in the street during the day. We'd yell car when one appeared. The lot was another favorite place. It was an empty lot, too small for a house, nothing but dirt rocks and sticks. But we made imaginary worlds there out of the mud built up to dem demarcate rooms in our imaginary buildings. Thanks, Eileen. Welcome. Unique, I see you have your hand up. Okay. Blair was a fun place to live. I have fun memories of my friends who lived there. But Blair Avenue would not have been half as much fun without my brother, Richard. He was three years older than me, but not too old that he, could, he did not want to play with me. I will long remember 
one winter day when he decided to round up the gang to go ice skating on the pond. It really wasn't a pond, just a huge hole in the ground from a construction site that had filled up with rainwater and had frozen. We did not have ice skates, but our boots worked just fine to slide across the frozen pond. It was so exhilarating sliding and twirling around until suddenly we heard a loud crack. Me and my friends quickly got off the ice, except Richard decided to take one last slide and that's when he fell through the ice. Thank you, Unique. <laughs> I, I'm curious about <laughs> what happened <laughs> next. He lived, but it was- <laughs> that's, that's good, that's good. So Bucky, I see you have your real hand up. So if you wanna share a little bit, and then uh, Stefona, you'll be after yeah, Bucky. Yes, uh, the place that I went back to because of the prompt, uh, recommended early in life and I went back to a place of California woods uh, where my father worked part-time for a short few years on weekends and I have a few sentences from that experience I was seven eight nine years old in the rain we'd sit with our picnic food in the shelters dad listening to sports on the radio and sneaking away every now and then to place a bed or two at River Downs Sometimes picnickers would prime the extra long two bump slide with waxed paper, and I'd join the fun while their families drank secret beer and played horseshoes. This was where I met nature head on when big thunderstorms and the creek became a mighty force unleashed. And this was where very near 30 years later, I bought the house where I live very nearby. Thank you, Bucky. Stefona, do you still want to share? Yes, I'd like to, if I may. Yes, indeed. Okay. Riviera Place was a great street to grow up on. Okay, not as great as the French Riviera, all exotic and debonair, but it was fun and cozy and safe and exciting and peaceful. It was home. In my mind, very often, even now, it's still home, 25 years since I moved away. Ours was that street, that community, where nearly everyone was like extended family. Mr. Bill and Miss Pat directly across the street were there soon after the subdivision was built. Two of their three children were older than my brothers and I, but we all still got along well. They bred and trained dogs, mainly Weimaraners. I hated those dogs. They looked weird for one thing, and they were always jumping that fence. Well, honestly, we believed they could walk over that fence anytime they wanted to. That's great. Thank you, Stefana. Thanks to all of you. Is there anyone, anyone else? I'm not seeing any other uh, physical or virtual hands up, and I think we would have time probably for one or two more if anyone would like to. Okay, so any, uh, before I do, I'm going to pull the slides back up again, and I just want to talk a little bit about memoir, but before I do, even if you don't want to share um, your writing, if anyone has anything they would just like to say about the process, things that came up for you uh, within within the process, feel free to unmute yourself and, and, and speak. So I'll give a couple of uh, seconds to see if anyone would like to do that. Pauletta. Yeah, um, I, I had a cheat. I, so I'm, I had to get into Google Maps and look at the streets. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what occurred to me was that, you know, some of these names didn't come back to me. And so I had to get my facts. And so I guess that's a, that's a lesson about uh, doing the memoir stuff is, is, uh, you know, being able to, uh, to pull this stuff out and, and not always having it, having to work a little bit at that. Uh huh. And then, you know, the it's it's sometimes you may want to just start with memory and then check fact uh -huh. check after. So that's, you know, that's a possibility too. It looks like Lauren and then Karen. And I saw Maureen came off mute as well. Okay. So uh, let's say Lauren, Karen, Maureen, and then Unique. I'm not sure if your hand is still up or, or up again. Is it my turn to speak? Yes, Lauren. Lauren. Yeah, no, I, uh, it, it was an interesting exercise because 
I didn't expect myself to have to keep struggling against just stating facts of like, this is where this was, and this is what happened, and this is what, you know, I mean, it was sort of, bo I was boring myself. <laughs> mm. I mean, you know, and, and then I worked more at getting a little imaging going and, um, you know, putting in the, f the feel of the f scarf and the mittens and, mm -hmm. you know, but, but it was hard to get out of that, you know, fact mm -hmm. level that I was on. So I maybe the that. so maybe the map for you kind of took you to a, a factual place and yeah, and you might need a little, was, yeah. a little more yeah, time to go helpful. underneath. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, it was an interesting experience. That's all. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Karen, and then Maureen. Yeah, I was struck by um, how just how memory works and how I started to write about a house next door to ours that had bats that would go into the attic and people would sit and we'd count them every night. But then, there, then I remember that that same house burnt down, and not, not burnt totally down. And then that reminded me of another thing, you know, and so I was like kind of weaving in and out of stories, which I'm kind of interested in like essays that kind of do that, that kind of like, I forget what they call them, maybe braided memories or braided essays or something where, you know, you can kind of do that and, and um, yeah. But that, that was interesting to me. And that is one of the one of the cool things about memoir is you can pretty much do anything that works, <laughs> you know, so you can tell a complete story or you can you can make those leaps uh, and and have have people follow you as long as the as long as the connections um, are clear enough within within the story. Uh, Maureen and then Leslie, and I think that's probably all we have time for. If I miss somebody, Maggie, you can you can let me let me know. Uh, Maureen, and then Leslie, and then Maggie will let me know if I missed anybody. Um, I think drawing the map, I wouldn't expect it to do that. And by drawing a map, all of a sudden, I realized there was. Um, it brought up the memory of a golf course behind the house I grew up in. And it made me realize that every place I've ever lived has had to have had a lot of space behind it. Mm -hmm. And I really think it stems from when you looked out in our backyard, you had all this open space. And even now I live in a condo group, but I live on the lake so that I don't have people directly behind me. And I think to all the places I've lived, we've never had anyone behind us. It's always mm -hmm. been open. So I just thought it was an interesting insight. I don't think I would have gotten or even thought about if I hadn't drawn that map first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you, Maureen. And I just want to I want to sort of uh, draw that to something what what Karen was saying, this idea of, of a braided essay or a lyric essay, you could write a memoir about what was behind every house you've ever lived in. <laughs> As as it's you know as sort of the uh, the, uh, the the focus or the thread that runs through it. Thank you, um, Leslie. And then I think that's probably it. We'll move in into the slides again. Okay, um, I started writing about um, the first apartment building my mom and I moved into when we came to Cincinnati, um, but then. All of a sudden, all these things kept flooding back. I remembered the names of the people next door to us who lived there, the names of the landlords. I was only like, I don't know, seven or eight. Uh, so the story I started to tell just brought back a rush of these things. And I say that because in these past two years, it seems like my memory has totally gone awry. I can't think of, you know, my next door neighbors or, or anything, but all this stuff came flooding back. And I thought the original story I started to tell blossomed into something that I, I can get maybe several memories out of. I just thought that was marvelous. That's great. I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad, to, glad to hear that. And I hope that, that for those uh, you know, who may have, have either stayed with one thing or got stuck, that, that you can keep going back to this map to find uh, to find new memories and, and new av avenues, so to speak, to uh, to follow. So um, I'm going to go ahead and move to the slides. We'll have we'll have more time to to talk, I hope. But I just want to make sure. Um, 
that I'm able to at least touch on some of these ideas about memoir and then also to, to touch on the ideas um, about um, where you might take this. So I wanna, uh, I wanna read this two-part quote from William Zinsler, who has uh, written a lot about, about memoir and creative nonfiction. And I go back to this a lot, uh, this particular quote, as, as Anne McCracken and others who have worked with me on memoir know. So a good memoir requires two elements, one of art, the other of craft. The first element is integrity of intention. Memoir is the best search mechanism that writers are given. Memoir is how we try to make sense of who we are, who we once were, what values and heritage draped us. If a writer seriously embarks on that, on that quest, readers will be nourished by the journey, bringing along many associations with quests of their own. And I really do believe that about memoir, and that's kind of the art piece. You know, it's like if you if you move into memoir with the intention to discover, then you'll discover. And if we read it, we'll discover as well. You know that that's 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 the work of that's the work that memoir does. But it doesn't just sort of happen by itself. It doesn't just fall on the page because the other element, as William Zinsler says, is carpentry. Good memoirs are a careful act of construction. We like to think that an interesting life will simply fall into place on the page. It won't. Memoir writers must manufacture a text imposing narrative order on a jumble of half-remembered events. And with that feat of manipulation, they arrive at a truth that is theirs alone not quite like that of anybody else who was ever present at the, at, this, at the same events. So it's the carpentry piece that I want to just spend a little bit of time on um, before we end our time together. So, you know, going with the sort of metaphor of carpentry, some tools of memoir. And again, you don't need to kind of write all this down, even if you're fascinated by it, because you'll be getting the, uh, um, the, the slides uh, via a PDF after, after the, the workshop. So the main tool or one of the main tools of memoir is story. And there are two aspects of story. Um, the first is scene, and I heard a lot of really nice scenes in the in the in the stories that we that we heard today. Um, but just a reminder that scene implies a place. That's what we started with: location, a specific time, uh, and sense of movement across time. It's it's like it's not like you're just taking a snapshot. You're actually allowing in a scene for the story to unfold. And then within that scene, you often will have dialogue, not always, but, you, but usually, <coughs> characters, description. And I just gave a little, a little made up example here uh, down at the bottom. The sun was barely over the trees when we arrived that Sunday. Grandmother looked like she'd been dressed in her scratchy wool suit for hours. Late again, I see. So a specific, the beginning of a specific made up scene, by the way, my, my granny never had a suit on in her life, I don't think. Um, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't, she was soft, not scratchy, but so it's a made up scene. But also within story, you can do summary, which is the generalization of time. So for example, most Sundays, we would pick grandmother up for church. I would start the journey half asleep, but wake when we hit the gravel road. So not that Sunday when, when Granny had that, that scratchy suit on and was complaining about us being late, even though we were on time, you know, but most Sundays, this is what we did. That's summary. That's sort of taking things that happen a lot and put them together um, into one uh, one little story that still has a lot of things like dialogue and 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 um, and movement and and characters. Those are the two main um, the main tools of memoir. But beyond that, and this is a uh, you know this is sort of where I always go, being being a poet as opposed to a storyteller. I often will go directly to reflection, forgetting the the scene and the summary. Others go to different places, but unlike with fiction, you don't you don't just do, have to do the story. You also 
um, as part of part of memoir, you get to tell how, how you are, were, or are now feeling about all of this. You know, and some of that's going to happen in the scene, but some of it happens in sort of looking back. And so my example here was, for years, I thought that grandmothers with soft white hair and aprons lived only in the pages of books. I didn't believe my friends who claimed they had grannies and mamas who would sneak them candy or smother them with kisses and the occasional gift. So, you know, once you set up the story and the characters, you can actually start to reflect a little bit and say what it means to you. And that's, and people expect that from memoir. Um, and then finally, and I was, I was really, uh, I was really glad to hear again, as, a, as someone who is a poet, I was glad to hear some of this, even in these little, little snippets that, that everyone shared imagery as in figurative language. So not just the tree itself, you know, but how the tree provided a shelter, you know, that a tree as a, shel as a sheltering sense, for example. Um, so it's using those concrete details that come out in all of the writing that we may do around scene and summary and exploring them as metaphors. You know, what did they mean for us? So for, for, for Maureen, this idea of space behind her house, for example. If she were writing a memoir that, that dealt with that sense of space, she might explore a little bit about what the space really sort of stood for her in her life. Was it loneliness? Was it expansiveness? Was it, you know, <coughs> you know what all, all the different possibilities? And I gave an example here in the little made up memoir of how the stiff scratchy wool of grandma's suit or the gravel spitting up that hit the sides of the road might be a, a kind of um, symbol of the unpleasantness of this, of this uh, luckily fictional grandmother. And then finally, in terms of a tool of memoir um, exposition, and the expository writer getting to the point and just telling us what happened, for goodness sakes, or telling us what we what you think or what we should think. This is the kind of writing that we learned in school. And you don't get to do much of this in memoir. <laughs> you know, you get a little bit of, of room for this kind of exposition. But basically, it's all about showing and reflecting. And um, so one of the things in working with, with student memoirs, for example, and, and when I do college work, is I have to help them unlearn what they still need in their, you know, in, in their academic papers, perhaps, but they don't need a thesis statement, you know, at the at the beginning of, of a memoir. That instead, we need to come to the understanding ourselves. So, for example, if I had just written in my little fictional memoir that I hated those weekly visits with Grant with my grandmother, you really wouldn't know very much, you know, you wouldn't know why, you wouldn't know what kinds of things she might have said, you wouldn't know really anything except that, oh, here's a girl who doesn't like her grandmother, what's, what's up with that, you know, but it's, it's it, instead, you know, allowing the details to kind of show the discomfort is, is what, um, what memoir does its best, you do get to use a little bit of exposition to move from one place to another, but not nearly as much of it as, as you might think if, if you were listening to those, the teachers around, uh, around writing expository essays or, or just sort of telling us, telling us um, getting to the point. So, and, and one of the things that I like to say is that if you find yourself skimming along the surface and doing a lot of exposition, slow down and show what's, what's going on. Um, so I just wanted to, to put those out there as, um, and, we'll, and we can, we'll have a little bit of time so we can stop and, and talk about them if you have questions or examples that you would like to, to, to give, but mostly because, um, I, I saw it as maybe a, a way of thinking about how to expand on the story that you've started today. Because my hope is that, you know, the map can provide you with multiple writing prompts in the days and weeks to come. Um, you know, writing about multiple spots on your map, um, you know, using again, here is where I am, or even I remember, or I am from. You know, here are some ideas, and here's here's a, a website to look more at the I am from prompt. 
Um, but, you know, thinking about these tools of memoir and thinking about what you've written so far, you know, I've already sort of fessed up that I go to reflection before I go to scene, you know, so where do you go? So if you mostly do summary, for example, you know, sort of spreading over those those weeks and months of time as, as where you might have lived as a child, you know, add in some scene and reflection. If you mostly do scene, um, think about adding in reflection and consider summarizing some of those stories that maybe don't feel as important. If only reflection, like me, be sure to add some stories. <laughs> you know, if there's no imagery, think about whether or not there's a detail in your writing that might add, uh, uh, that you might be able to create a metaphor or, or um, a simile from that might take some sort of symbolic meaning in your writing. And here you'll, you'll get this as, as a link, but I've given you a, an example of a really short little memoir that I think does all of this to some, to some degree. And so I would just encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so I've given a couple of other little prompts, which you will, um, you'll be able to see and read on your own. And one I think gets you in more into reflection. Um, and that is, you know, if you feel like you're skimming over emotion, kind of take what's happening and start with the phrase, what I mean to say, or what's under that is, you know, sort of keep digging down to see what you might be, be trying to, uh, that, that image that you're writing about or that place or time you're writing about is really trying to tell you. And then another one in this, so that gets to reflection. And this one I think gets a little bit more to, um, to scene and that's crack to, called to crack it open. So for example, if you've got a line such as grandma always called me on my birthday. And I think always is, is sort of a key, a key term here for, uh, you know, for what can be cracked open. Then write that line at the top of the page and follow it with a scene of one time grandma called you on your birthday and what happened then. Um, so I'm going to take this down and then I'll pull that back up later. But we've got just, we don't have very much time. We've got just a couple of minutes. And so I'm just curious, and you can do this by, by literally raising your hand or, or raising your virtual hand and uh, letting me know if you have questions or comments. And Karen, your hand is still raised, but I don't think you mean to. Yeah. So um, it, yeah, so just let me know if there's something you'd like to say about this. I know I went through it really quickly. Uh, so I or let, actually let's start with Tom because he hasn't spoken yet. Tom and then Eileen and then Lauren. Um, I guess I, I was really struck by your point there of uh, about exposition, because I feel like I, as someone who's trained as an academic, I feel like I tend to do that quite a bit. Um, so I'm wondering if you could, I was really struck by that idea of like slowing down and, and so forth. I wonder if you have anything else to add to that or any other advice that you give to your students? Uh, oftentimes with exposition, I just have them get rid of that sentence because what I, what I find much of the time when people are doing memoir that it's in, you know, th those of you who've worked with me in poetry know I say a sim have said a similar thing about poetry, get rid of the doors, you know, people don't want to be, people don't need to be at the door, they want to be in the room. So you might need to write, for example, you know, I hated grandma in order then to be able to write what is next, which was she was always so damn mean to me or, or you know, or what, you know, whatever. And then you keep going down and down and you get to it. So in the revision process, just get rid of all of that. You know, start somewhere in the, and, 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 this, and this might be, is, is something else that I do actually say to students. There's a, a term, it's a Latin term in media ray, which is spelled like media, then R-E-S is ray, but it means starting in the middle. 
And you notice that with plays or movies or even books, you know, you'll have a scene that starts somewhere in the middle and you don't know what's going on until you start getting down into it. And so that might be, you know, sort of a, a clue within memoir as well. Start someplace in the middle of the scene and then work your way back to where you need to go and get rid of those doors. Um, Eileen and then, thanks Tom, Eileen and then Lauren. Yeah, my question was about exposition too. And I was just wondering what you think about, you know, as a first draft, you know, writing the facts, writing the exposition, and then using that as sort of the basis for then going into the scene, or do you think that's too constraining? You know, I think it's, it probably is a really personal, um, it, it's a personal decision of sort of where, where you start and what you need to start with. I do feel like though that too, sticking too um, closely to the facts at the beginning of a fast write can stop me from going to the emotional and, and image and concrete place that I need to go. Um, so if I were starting with facts, I might want to start with facts like what something smelled like, you know, or what, what it looked like or what the sounds were, and then see where that would see where that would take me uh, from there. And I also just want to mention that I specifically had us write before I talked anything about the tools of memoir. And I, I really do feel like that that's important that, you know, write, writing down into your subject and then figuring out what to do with it in revision, as opposed to starting thinking you have to do something a certain way. Because all of these, all of these ideas and, and the tools of memoir really are more about revision than they are about that first draft writing. Um, so we have Lauren and then Anne, and then we're going to need to wrap it up, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I have spoken a lot. Um, the only, I was just thinking about ending, you know, ending a poem is one thing. I mean, you know, I can usually sense, okay, you know, this feels complete. Mm -hmm. I don't know about ending a memoir. I mean, uh, do you tend to just take a uh, particular like vignette sort of, and, and then it completes itself, you know, when you decide to stop doing it or mm -hmm. when you're interrupted or whatever, or, I mean, is there anything you want to say about ending one? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, and, but it is also one of those sort of form follows function questions because it depends so much on the memoir. But I do like actually with, with memoir as well as poems, this idea of framing. So that if you start with something, you might bring yourself back to it, but in a different way, you know? So if you start with a scene with the mother, for example, perhaps you end with that same scene, but add reflection to it, or you end with a different scene with the mother. You know, if you started, you know, start your memoir in the kitchen, end it in the, in the kitchen, you know, that idea of framing, and that doesn't work all the time, but it is one, one tool, you know, one thing to potentially try. I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, but I know we're I know we're at time and folks have other things. So Anne, do you want to? Yeah, real quick. Um, my question has to do with uh, too much personal. How to find a way to balance what feels very very personal with what you feel might interest other people, and and. Mm -hmm. and so and you're going out, but I. Yeah, you're you're kind of going out, but I but I did I do uh, I did get the gist of that question, and I think what I would what I would say about that is that really the only universal is in the specific, <laughs> and that's that's kind of a truism. But not to worry so much about whether or not you know your personal story of you know how you met. Uh, uh, to to do Gail about how she got her first kiss on on the school bus and then love went love went away after that you know somebody else may have had their first lost love someplace else but it's just sort of remembering uh, you know the fact that that you're giving all these specific details about about your own circumstances gives other people permission to remember those circumstances in, in their life. And of course, you know, that's not 
there can be too much as well as too little, but as a that's just sort of a truism. Um, I, I want to um, I, I want to just remind folks that there is uh, office hours, my first office hours on on uh, Tuesday, and you can find out more about that on the Writer in Residence website. Um, and this could be another place to bring questions as well as, as share little tidbits or snippets from your, your writing. And Maggie just put, uh, put the login for signing up. We added a couple of more spots to that. So hopefully folks can get in. And, and Maggie, do you wanna say anything to, to, um, to finish us up here? Yeah, just a brief thank you to everyone for taking uh, some time on this snowy Saturday to join us and for sharing your thoughts um, and your words. And a big thank you, of course, to Pauletta for uh, leading us all through um, this lovely afternoon. And this is wonderful. As Pauletta mentioned, um, you can find out more about what we have uh, coming up through the rest of the year on the um, Cincinnati Library website, which I just posted in the chat. Um, and Pauletta has mentioned several times, we're going to be sending out a follow-up email within the next week. So watch out for that. That'll contain slides from today. It'll also contain um, the recording once we get it posted and um, maybe a brief survey if you're able to share your feedback on um, how this session today went for you. Uh, but since it's Saturday, I won't keep anybody any longer. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed it. I loved your questions. Sorry, I didn't get to answer more of them, but I'm sorry I didn't get to hear more of you, but uh, but I really loved being with you. So, so, so thanks for being here and hope to see you again.